Yes, it's good to be back home. It's good to be back with you. It's been a while. Uh, I'm really excited about tonight's broadcast because this is something that, it's one of those topics that I think about all the time and I don't necessarily bring to my Evoke families. I bring to the people that I do some coaching with or when I do supervision, of course, and in therapy and with other programs, I share a lot of these topics. But I think, as always, there's some overlap. There's some takeaway, something to extrapolate from to parenting. But, but I think the reason that I wanted to do it, that I was willing to do it at this place now was I, I get a lot of calls, a lot of emails from former families asking me for referrals or asking me for advice on how to navigate finding a therapist or, or working with a therapist that they do like, but that they find they have some limitations in terms of how, in, how to bridge the, the work that was being done at Evoke with, with their child and with their family and the work that they want to do at home uh, with, with family therapy. So that's where this comes from. So for me, that last part of it, people calling, people reaching out, I had a couple of people most recently uh, ask me those kinds of questions. I thought to myself, I think this is something worthy for parents. So there, there are lessons, of course, here for parents, but this is specifically for thinking about getting a therapist that you can enjoy, can benefit from, can, can help support you in your process, maybe while your child is still at Evoke, but also what happens after Evoke and going forward in your, in your life. Um, I want to talk a little bit about niches in therapy and population. There is, of course, benefit to having somebody who works with, if you have an eating disorder in your family or a history of it, who works with an eating disorder. If you have substance abuse issues and they have very little to no substance abuse background and training, that can be a challenge for them. So, and, and of course, there are severe and extreme niches in the mental health field. So all that can, can be helpful. But I will tell you, I've done supervision uh, with people that, that have a practice that I have very little experience with. So I'm talking about something deeper than the specific niche. Um, I'm talking about something beneath the tools, the, the specific interventions or techniques. It, it, again, it goes back to, as I talk about all the time, a sensibility or a way of being with people that I think transcends every population that we deal with. So, so with that, I, I, I want to invite you to kind of consider both. Or consider the, the, the population that they have experience in or have, have research, but also a, a deeper process that can be important. I, I think part of it is understanding are they good at working with families too because there are many therapists who aren't trained to work with families and or parents or relationships they can do individuals. I was formally trained primarily in working with families and relationships. But a lot of my work is with individuals. And, and I'll tell you this, this is something important to understand. Even family therapists can work with individuals. The, the, I've said this many times, but one of the, the, the fathers of family therapy never saw two people at the same time. But it was the lens through which he saw things. It's how he understood relationships. And they, the, they related in that context. Um, I, I think there's challenges when people don't understand what wilderness therapy is or residential treatment. I just spent a week in, back east on the East Coast, you know, working in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and I, I find I find it phenomenal. I run I run into this all the time that there are people that have very strong opinions, mental health professionals that have very strong opinions about wilderness therapy, and then when they're asked, "What do we do?" they have little to no idea. In many cases, it's some um, notion that they received from past ideas or, or heard from somebody, but they have no idea. So I think it's helpful to, to at least introduce therapists to the, to the notion about what goes on. I'll talk about some ways you can do that a little bit later. And then, of course, I think there's, there's value, of course, in having a therapist that a a teen, if you have a teen, or a young adult, if you have a young adult, can relate to, right? There are some people that are so removed from that age group 
that they don't know how to be cool, so to speak, right? In fact, I think in some cases with those people, they've uh, they've grown up too much, right? They've grown, they've become disconnected from teens. And age has nothing to do with it, right? My therapist is in her mid-70s, and she can still relate to small children and teenagers. So it's, it's those people that, that maybe have, have crossed over the generation gap and, and never looked back. They can become a problem in connecting with the teens or, or, or the young adults. Like I always say, it's okay for you to be a consumer. If therapists get impatient with your questions to them, you have a problem with that therapist, right? You're, that, that, that's a sign of rigidity, of insecurity, of agenda, right? So it's okay for you to ask questions. Some people ask me about PhDs or, M or, or master's degrees. And I have found some incredibly gifted therapists that don't have PhDs, that just have master's degrees. And I found plenty of PhDs who don't know the first idea about therapy. In fact, one of my challenges over the past couple of decades in hiring therapists was the PhD who thought they knew everything. And I've had that many, many, many times. So it's not necessarily that, that you need one over the other. I think you need somebody who's still passionate about the art of therapy and their own process about learning in therapy. And that can be really from any background. Similarly, whether it's a social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, which I want to be clear, most of you know this, but some people don't. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. And typically, has very little to, to, to almost no training in the practice of therapy. I want to be clear about that. They have maybe a rotation or a semester on the process of therapy, but their lens is the brain and the chemicals in the brain, right? Mental health is a brain chemistry problem for them that is solved by brain chemistry. Now, of course, I meet some that are creative and open, that work in conjunction with, with therapists, and I've met some very good therapists who are psychiatrists, who practice therapy. So, but, but that's something to be aware of. A family therapists, you know, these are people like myself, that's where my degree is, are trained in working with more than people, more than one person at a, at a time, and working on relationships and contexts. A mental health counselor, on and on and on. It's hard to beat experience. You know, if you're bright, if you're passionate, if you're open, those are fantastic attributes. But, but a lot of times, it's really hard to make up for 5, 10, 15, 20 years of practice or 30 years of practice. Like I say, it's okay to ask questions. I, I believe that you deserve intelligent answers, and, and more than once. Again, if you sense a therapist getting impatient or frustrated with you, ask them about it. And if they're feeling that way, that is a, a them problem, not a you problem. To be clear, when a therapist gets frustrated, upset, disgusted, impatient, angry, or anxious with their client, that's a them problem. And that's where they need their own supervision and their own therapy to sort through it so that they can come back and be there for you. Again, the, the specific disorder, issue, approach, notwithstanding, those feelings are a disconnection to the client. You know, I, I, I like the fact that I know my therapist has gone to therapy, goes to therapy, right? That gives me great comfort. And, and now that I've been with her for 20 years, it's obvious to me that she does, right? There are anecdotal stories that she tells, but I know she does by the way that she works. I think it's okay to ask your therapist, at least if they get supervision. You know, there's this idea that we get supervision when we're in training or, or we're an intern. But the fact of the matter is, is good therapists get su supervision their entire life. I mean, I get supervision from my therapist, right? 
I'm just as likely to take a case to my therapist, a struggle, a challenge that I'm having with a case to my therapist, and that's where I get my supervision. And she actually, I met her through supervision. She was hired to be a supervisor at somewhere that I worked 23 years ago. You know, I think one thing I'm thinking about all the time, um, it, it, you know, how much of it is their agenda versus meeting you where you're at? And again, it's not like I don't come into contact with clients with some ideas, right? Some basic beliefs. I have that, of course. But, but the fact of the matter is that I have to hold that lightly in, in the context of meeting with people and seeing them where they're at. And I absolutely have to practice not being right and not having it be my agenda that takes the, 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 the front stage, if you will. Um, this idea of individual versus family therapy, I'll, I'm going to say two or three things about this. One is in the context of the Finding You program that we have, that we've opened. Finding You and Finding Family. I encourage a lot of people who, who want to do Finding Family, right, want to do a family intensive or retreat, to do an individual one first. In my own experience, in my own therapy with my wife, with my family, um, I've been going to this therapist for somewhere around 20 years. And she's also our, our, our family therapist and she's also our marriage therapist. Uh, in, in the last 10 years, I've only had a, a handful of sessions with another family member present. And in the early years, I had that more often. But I realized, I've realized since then that the problems that I have in relationships are about me. And then if I can get grounded, get aware, work on myself, find a way to express that, that truth, right, live in that place, then I can navigate and work that out and she becomes my home base. So uh, for me as a therapist, I'm pretty flexible. You know, somebody could show up to my office. I'm, I'm, I might be thinking that, that I'm meeting with one person. They could show up with six people, and I'm open to that. A lot, some therapists won't work with, like my therapist does, they won't work with two people in the same family and then work with them individually, right? That's just their approach. I've been trained that way. I actually prefer that as a, as a practitioner. Um, and I prefer that as a client because then that therapist knows everybody. Um, flexibility is, is a trait of a therapist that, that I value. You know, it's that adage that I've shared with you all before that master therapists pride themselves on what they don't know what they haven't figured out, and what they don't say. Flexibility is something. And some therapists use the word boundaries to, to, to justify a, a kind of rigidity around things. So and that's something that you learn over time. Can they go with the flow? Can they adjust on the fly? Or is there a lot of rigidity there? Um, the, the difference between family therapy and individual therapy is, in, in some ways, when I'm doing therapy with two people, you know, I'm doing some skills, I'm giving them some common language and, and maybe a bridge to, to find each other, but in some ways I'm also finding one and then finding the other. And, and in doing that and modeling that, I'm helping them see each other at the same time. Because we, if we all see each other, most of it works out. And then you sprinkle in there some skills, some shared language, uh, that, that bridge, and you have family therapy. Um, you know, whose goals are it in therapy? You know, ideally it's your goal in therapy, your family's goals, or your, your child's goals. Um, and like I said, individual therapy can still be family therapy. Flexibility is, is, a, is a primary trait that I look for, not knowing. You know, being a, a beginner's mind is a trait that I look for in, in a therapist when I'm training. Watch for that, that idea of using boundaries as an excuse for rigidity. Your boundaries are healthy, and you're allowed to take care of yourself in whatever way you feel necessary. And sometimes rules, for the sake of rules, are what I watch out for when somebody, again, is hiding behind them to, to, to support, to prop up a kind of rigid stance. You know, we use diagnostics as a shorthand. That's really what it is. And I'll say this very clearly, but, but underneath 
all diagnoses are you know, some woundingness, some woundedness, you know, some, some genetic predisposition and some combination of those two. And then the symptoms show up in a certain kind of pattern that, that's repetitive and predictive, that, that generally um, asks a certain kind of intervention and approach. And we call that pattern a diagnosis. So it's okay for shorthand, but, but if you get the feeling that you're a case, a diagnosis versus a human for the therapist, that's something to watch out for. When I'm thinking about a client, I'm thinking about them and their wounds. The fact that they have a, a narcissistic style or a borderline style or an addictive style or an anxious or a depressed style pattern, that's less important. What I'm looking for is the wound underneath that. A, a good therapist is patient, of course, and their impatience or, or anxiety or eagerness is a sign of, of less skill. Right, uh, inadequate sensibility. They're humble. They can apologize and make mistakes. They don't have to be right. Right? They have ideas and thoughts that they'll share, things that they'll reflect back, but they don't have to be right. They meet you where you're at. They're still learning. And you'll, you'll see it over time. You'll see it because they'll adjust. They'll have new ideas. They'll share things like, I thought about this earlier, and then I rethought about it after we met. They'll share with you books that they've read, right? New, new lectures that they've heard. They're still learning. There's a lot of uh, debate around self-disclosure. Um, my experience is that it's, again, it's one of those areas that I think people can be very rigid about. Obviously, you know I use a lot of self-disclosure. Um, but, but it's not raw and unprocessed, right? That's what I do with my therapist. I make sure that, that I'm taking care of myself there. I'm not self-disclosing for the purpose of taking care of myself in the session. I'm doing it to, to teach something or to model something. So I, I'm pro self-disclosure, but, but that's something that each person has to work out. And if somebody, again, is rigidly against it, that's something that I don't think would be a good match for me. Um, your preferences, your ideas, your agendas, your requests are not simply marginalized as your issues, right? So you, you, you challenge them. You have a question. You have a problem with something that they said or did. And when it gets, when it gets put back to you as this is your issue, you're dealing with an inadequate therapist at the time at least. We all have moments of inadequacy, but that's an inadequate response. Their job is to first understand you, empathize with where you're coming from, understand your concern, value and honor your concern, and then to work with you on it, on resolving it. What are the processes you know, around advice or directives? Um, I'm reluctant. To give, it, well, to give advice for sure. But directives, I, I, I want to be careful about that. Because when I find myself giving directives when they are not requested, assignments when they are not requested, that's when I'm aware of my own counter-transference, my own feeling toward the patient or the issue bubbling up. Right? I have that agenda for it to change or be fixed. So I have to be aware of that and look at that. And, and definitely, I don't want to create an experience with, with families that I work with in, in private practice where uh, I don't want to give, give an experience where they feel like if they don't do their assignments that they feel ashamed or they don't want to come back. So we'll talk about things that they might try or might do or might read or might watch, and it's okay if they don't. I don't need you to get better anytime soon. That's, I don't have that agenda. I don't have a timeline for you. They're, of course, empathic and understanding. When they get frustrated, angry, impatient, anxious, eager, annoyed, disapproving, shaming, labeling, focused on their model, their agenda, their theory, to the cost or exclusion of yours, you're dealing with inadequacy. Right? 
Those are all signs of inadequacy. The ideal sense is what can I do for you? And, and I've, I've been in situations where I don't know what the client wants from me. I'm confused by it. I've tried a couple of approaches, responses, shared with them a few things I've thought about what they're saying, and I get some resistance back. And so my question has been, I'm not sure how I can be helpful here. What would you like from me? How can I support you? Right? How can I be with you? And being with you doesn't mean I'm fixing you. It just means I'm being with you, supporting you where you need to go. Now I have a handful of quotes that I want to share with you with some of these concepts from various places. I'm going to give you the references to these places at the end of this. Therapy has become problem solving rather than a process of the discovery of self. The discovery of self is not fostered by offering advice or answers, but rather by asking better questions. Gill refers to this advice giving a form of therapy as abuse. The therapist or guide we choose must not duplicate the wound of the past. Thus, if the therapist or guide knows what is right for us and manipulates us to achieve, the, achieve these quote-unquote treatment goals, it is abuse plain and simple. It is hard to see how good abuse ever cures bad abuse. I love that idea. Be, be careful of that idea that the therapist knows your truth and is there to give it to you right it's not a fixing thing it's a finding thing it's it's healing through a, a new kind of attachment experience an adequate container i'll talk about container for several slides here this is from jamie gill's book finding human part of the business of psychotherapy is to discover and create alternative experiences for thoughts feelings and attitudes and beliefs this is undertaking, undertaken in the service of freeing people to be able to re-experience themselves in a safe but different context. The virtue of talking to an empathic other, an accepting person who has a different base, is that it quickly illuminates one's own. What was automatic and unconscious is noticed and discussed. The world is allowed to become one of noticeable constructions. Right? It's a different, it's showing up and getting a different reaction than we've received in our past. And like I said, good therapists pride themselves on what they don't know and what they don't say. Something about ju judgment. One could call the practice of applying terms, techniques, and theory without the recognition of the therapeutic process doing psychology. It may be evident in statements like, you are in denial, you are rationalizing. In their frustration and with an overwhelming sense of impotence at their ability to make behavioral change, therapists may claim his mother has personality, uh, borderline personality disorder, and her unwillingness to receive feedback is evidence of this resistance, her resistance. These labels and assumptions often bespeak the clinical staff's frustration and may ultimately serve to ensure that the therapist does not encounter their own self, which may lie buried deep in the unconscious in order to preserve a sense of likability. While labels can be a shorthand for therapists to identify patterns of defenses in clients, they are often used to excuse the therapists from the equation. Miller suggests the idea that therapists may cloak their disapproval and derision behind abstract terms like borderline, obsessive, regression, destructive, but unless they are willing to explore the three-year-old boy, girl or boy, inside themselves, they may not see the parallel between these terms and garden variety contempt. So th th there's a way that therapists cloak their judgment in the practice of applying psychology to their clients. And if you walk away with a, a, a feeling of unwellness, something's wrong, share it with them and how they learn to process how they do process it will tell you all that you need to know i want to be very clear i make mistakes as a therapist all of the time i've made all of these mistakes that's why i know about them but the process of continuing to learn to be open to to, to apologize to, to work through it that, that's this 
this thing that I'm talking about here. The therapist, like the parent, is an adequate container. Remember, the child is not your container, but you are theirs. An adequate container, is an, it's an authentic reaction. It's rational. It's honest. It's not based in fear. It's an ability to tolerate the other person. It provides safety. You can have your own emotions, but they're yours as a container. And you're able to, to monitor your reactions, to, to seek compensation, right? You're not, it's the opposite of being triggered. Triggered in anxiety, fear, frustration, and anger. That's what a container is. When you become frustrated or disappointed with a client or other people for that matter, you have lost some contact with the other. If you could really see them and connect to them, then you would not be frustrated because you would understand them. Attachment theory tells us that a person's sense of well-being is the result of having a parent who provided an adequate container. An adequate container is the mind of the parent where the child expresses himself as welcomed and safe. If the parent was able to hold the child in her mind, that is, tolerate the child, then the child's experience is that they are okay. When the parent's limitations are expressed in disappointment, disgust, or anger, the child is likely to interpret these message, this message as, I am not okay. And in order to manage this feeling of dread that comes when my parent is upset, I will learn to put away those things that seem to be upsetting her. And one more about an adequate container. If they have no sense of their wounds or limitations, they won't be able to provide an adequate container for their client to discover their own context. An effective container is a place where one feels safe to explore all the parts of themselves, free from judgment. In this way, the container is the mind of the therapist. Therapy is not a place where we go to listen to difficult things, but rather a place that we go in order to share difficult things. One of the authors of the paper uh, heard a therapist say to a client, if you came into a session and told me you were in love with a chicken, I would assume you would have a good reason and I would be curious. It's this kind of container that allows us to re-experience ourselves and rid ourselves of shame. After, and after shame subsides, we can see the wound with compassion and heal. And one last quote. Both cruel people and inadequate therapists are famous for a desire to destroy defenses without considering the consequences. So, so a therapist honors the defense, respects it, values it, is gentle with it. And that in that way, they're, they're more apt to travel the road to healing than they are to behavioral management or shame or, or sublimation, which is covering up the symptom in one area and having it crop up the wound crop up somewhere else in your life. Let's talk a little bit about resistance. That this idea of embracing a client's resistance, right? Going with it instead of fighting it. Perhaps the extreme development of the new view is what is known as countertransference self-disclosure. The therapist reveals to the patient what he or she is feeling. So as to highlight the difference between the analyst's experience of, the, of that patient. In one opinion, this implies an entirely different view of what communication between parent and therapist is all about. The classical late 20th century view that it, that it is, not a matter of confessing to the calendar transference, but of recognizing and integrating it into the interpretation. So it's, I'm feeling anxious right now. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling frustrated with the story you're telling about your mother. Feeling angry at your mother. Feeling angry at your, your spouse your child right now. If the therapist does not get emotionally involved sooner or later in a manner that he had not intended, therapy will not proceed to a successful conclusion, right? So it's this idea that this is going to come up for us, but it's going to be part of the grist for the mill. It's talking about it. Some of the references that I use tonight, I have my own website. So some of these are from that website, from, from specifically the blog, Climbing to the Top of the mount, to the Mountaintop debunking the myth of the therapist guru or looking for a therapist who looks for you and one I just did recently, how to discover the real self. So all of those are available on drbradreedy.com. And then there's also a scholarly article that I wrote that I published in the, in the National Association of Therapeutic Schools and Programs along with my wife. 
and it's called Psychology Versus Therapy, Impl Implications for the Practice and Supervision of Therapy in Residential Treatment and Wellness Therapy Program. So th those are some of the reference points. So what are the take-homes? It's not your job to train your therapist, but it is your job to ask them questions and tell, you what, tell them what you need and see how they respond, even to your complaints. My very first therapist uh, that I studied under told me she didn't trust her clients until they fought with her. And what she meant is that's a really honest and courageous place to be. You can ask tough questions, and you deserve intelligent answers, and you deserve patience. If you feel yourself as an object in their way, especially as a parent, I think it happens a lot for therapists who work with children, adolescents and young adults included, that they get frustrated with the parent because they're trying to get use the parent to get to where they need to go. And they forget to consider the parent as their own person. And that's a lot of my passion and work with our training with our therapists is we're treating the whole family. And so that doesn't mean that the parent is this ancillary thing and I'm really just treating the child, but the parent is a child of somebody, has a past, has a wound. And I'm going to hold that with as much love and gentleness as I will any child that I'm working with. How you feel matters and ought to be treated, not to be treated merely as your issue. Well, that's your defensiveness. That's your control. That's your anxiety. If it's marginalized in those ways, then you're dealing with inadequacy in a therapist. It's okay to disagree with your therapist. I think it's probably not okay not to disagree. If you're never disagreeing with your therapist, then you're avoiding perhaps experiencing the same kind of um, negative experience you had when you disagreed with other authority figures in your life. And it's okay to share with them how you feel. And you deserve to be held with compassion. All right, I'm happy to look at parent questions and comments. First question, I am 66 years old and considering a therapist who is 30 years old. I feel funny about working with a kid the age of my son, but I've had very good feedback from others about him. Wonderful. I don't think it's impossible to find a young therapist um, as long as they're not trying to spend time proving that they're a good therapist. So I've, I've, I've seen some talented young people before. And if this therapist is, is a good one at 30, just uh, imagine how great he or she is going to be when they're 50 or 60 if they're still doing it. Recently, I recently attended a parent workshop. We want to keep this positive dynamic moving toward forward after a vote. How do we find a therapist, doctor, etc., that share a vote's ethic and method? In the ways that I talked about tonight, I think that question may have come up early while I was talking tonight, but share with them your thoughts. Share with them what you've got. Educate. I mean, this is uh, this is this is not marketing for a vote, but share with them our website, our approach. Share with them some of the blogs, the the, the article that I wrote. Share with them my book. And again, my intention. I want to be careful because I'm not trying to proliferate the the evoke and, and Brad Beatty model and with all therapists, but just so they're they know where you're coming from, right? It. it, it it's important. I want to learn from my clients where they're coming from, what their history of treatment is, what their experience has been. I want to I want to find a bridge to where they've been to where they are now and where they want to go for sure. So share with them some of those resources. And if they if they seem to know everything already and they really don't of course, that's something to be wary of. So you can talk to them about all of this stuff. And it takes more courage than ever to talk to the therapist about the therapist. Next question. I have a growing belief that younger therapists are better trained in the growing field of therapy and its many branches of knowledge. That may be true. That's a good point. I've worked with therapists trained 30 years ago, and they seem to be woefully inadequate and unenlightened. Um, opinion? I think that, that that's a good point. I mean, the, the, the advantage that young people have is that they know they're still learning, right? I knew that when I was 30. I was passionate about learning. The weaknesses I, I had perhaps was that I was trying to prove myself. And that gets in the way of good therapy. But, um, yeah, 
old people sometimes are set in their ways and they've stopped learning. And whether you're a therapist or a parent or a spouse or a grandparent, that, that's a pretty unenlightened place to be. Like I always tease or use as an example, my grandparents, apparently, my mother's parents, according to the stories that I've heard, knew all the truth in the world that, that they needed to learn at the age of 30 and didn't seem to learn anything else afterwards. On the, on the contrary, my therapist, who's 76 years old, still attends class regularly and is an incredibly gifted, educated therapist, but she's still going to school. What do you think of my decision as, as ex-husband, who is only uh, one that connects honestly to our 15.5-year-old boy, who is in the third week of Cascades currently, to be the one parent in complete charge of trying to select the best therapist for him to see when he gets out um, in roughly nine weeks. These past two years of him, uh, excuse me, I have to adjust this, of him getting poor therapy from poor therapists has poor results. I'm willing to commit to 100 hours straight interviewing research to find the best person and get right therapy he needs. All I'd be considering is following these lines, these fine instructions as illustrated by Reedy. I, I hope I was clear enough in my last question. I may have added too much reference though, so don't be afraid to be directed tonight. Thank you for that. I think it's I, I think it's a balance. I think ask questions, interview them, absolutely. And and and, and then the and then the your, your son has to select within that range, right? Like you wouldn't want an abusive or an inadequate or an unskilled or not well trained one. So you're gonna rule those out. But then if if he, he gets kind of the final say. If it's a good fit. And by the way, folks, I, I got to tell you, in outpatient practice, right, as an outpatient therapist, if your, your, your client doesn't like you, your teenager or young adult doesn't like you, it's probably a you problem. It's not a them problem. And will this therapy in residential treatment? It may not be the same because there's, there's less choice, right? The therapist serves the role of therapist and also gatekeeper and, and rule giver. That's not the same in outpatient therapy. So if an outpatient therapy therapist is just punching a kid in the nose, metaphorically speaking, and the kid doesn't like them, that's a them problem. And they're probably really taking on some of the role of the parent. Maybe they're even following the parent's agenda. So a therapist is a person, an adequate therapist is somebody that, that as long as a, a child is willing to go, that they want to go back to again. The broadcast cut out a bit when you were talking about individual versus marital or family therapy. My husband and I have been in marital therapy, but currently are both seeing our therapist separately for now. Things kept going, pretty, getting pretty heated, and we all felt it was best to take a break from that. I feel this is going well for the moment and appreciate your comment about problems in your relationships are really about you, which I can certainly see. Our daughter is still in therapeutic boarding school, but probably due to graduate mid or late summer as a junior high as a junior in high school although the plan is up to her at this point would you mind repeating your thoughts about individual versus family or, or therapy together I, I think I was, you got most of it which is I've been in I've only been in maybe 10 sessions in the last 10 years with another member of my family at critical points when we wanted to navigate something or work something out but most of it's individual and I like, I do a mix as a practitioner. I'll meet with a couple, an individual, I'll have the son, daughter come, it doesn't matter. But, but I think you're wise to, to, shift, to, to, to shift it around. I, can't, I, I, I don't foresee a time in the near future when I want to do a couple session with my wife because I know what my work is. I know what I need to do to, to develop, to be a more loving, patient, supportive husband. I know what I need to do, what my work is, to have more peace and serenity and joy in my life. And my wife has very little to do with that. And I can, I can take that home and do it with it. So I'm okay with family therapy. Sometimes family therapy is the invitation into doing your personal work. In other words, I tell people all the time, bring your children in to say, we need help. We, the parents, need help. So we want you to come to therapy with us. Don't say, you need help. So you have to come to therapy with us. So it's an it's a entry into therapy that can lead eventually to individual work. And let me say this very clearly. 
If you bring a child into therapy reluctantly or ambivalently, let the therapist work through you. Meaning, I try to work through the most resilient, capable, and grounded person in the family. Not the least grounded, the least capable, the, the, the most anxious, the most fragile, which is often the child. So I'll tell the parents on the front end, I'm going to challenge you. And eventually the, the, the child will begin to trust that this is going to be fair, everybody's fair game, that then I can challenge them with love, with questions. So, on average, how many therapists do you meet with before you find a good match? That's a great question. You know, I use a lot of word of mouth. I use people that I trust. Um, it's, 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 it's just a couple, I think, because I, I rely so much on word of mouth. Somebody that I respect who's been at it a while, either a therapist or a client, and saying, who's good? And I don't give out 20 names in Salt Lake. You know, I give out two or three or four in Salt Lake. So I, I think a couple. There, there's some therapists that I give out that I know that the person's going to love them every single time because they're that skilled at what they do. So my daughter called me today. During the conversation, she started crying. She said she has been feeling down since she went back to school after the Christmas vacation. She said she is not sure why she is depressed. I asked her if she wants to go to a therapist. Her response is that she feels that she, could, that she should be able to handle this on her own. I suggested she go to a therapist. The problem is she is at school in another state, so I can't help her pick one. Also, she's in California school, on California school insurance, which means she has to go to the school therapist. I've told her there's, there's no shame in going to a therapist. I'm not sure what I'm asking about, but I'm anxious for some guidance. Let me back up a little bit. You bring up many good points. You can get a lot out of an adequate therapist. I keep talking about gifted therapists and exceptional therapists. If the therapist is adequate, if they'll work with you with the ideas and the principles that I've shared today, you can get a lot out of it. Sometimes they can help with problem solving or, or resolution around the depressive phase that she's going through. Right? That, that can, an adequate therapist can do some of that. For sure. I'm giving you really some fine brush strokes to kind of those of you who have called me or emailed me frustrated that you just can't seem to find one like Evoke. Oh, by the way, we also have our Evoke therapist will do life coaching. That's a new program of ours over the past few months. So you can hire an Evoke therapist, just contact our admissions department. So they'll do it at a very reasonable fee and do Skype calls with you or phone calls with you or your child. So that's a possibility. Some people don't like it. They like it in person, but I I, I, I forgot to mention that. Um, so it's okay for her to just, you know, what I would say to her is it helps me. Some people might find it helpful. I'll, I'll offer it to her if you would like. You don't have to go, but it might help. And it might not. Right? Maybe it won't. So you don't try to force them into it. You just offer it and share with them your own experience of talking to somebody. And, and offer it gently, not forcefully or coercively, born out of your anxiety, right? That, that would be the, the counter-transference of the parent, where if you start to get anxious, you start to get very invested in her going. It's the exact same experience that I've been describing all night when the therapist's agenda takes over, all right? My therapist recently asked me to share information about you with them because I kept talking about you. I think it's a good sign. Well, I both apologize and thank you for that. Matt Hoig is my son's therapist at Evoke. I, I like him a lot. He thinks like me. And by the way, just listening to Reedy from the, uh, from the view webinar, few webinars I have watched has been awesome. He thinks like me too. Well, I'm glad. I, I, hope, I hope we can make a connection. I hope these are helpful points of contact. And, and, I, and I, I, I try to hold on to the idea that I don't need to be right, that I can learn something, that I might say something wrong or miss something. Would you encourage an ex-wife to have a group therapist with just me if she's hesitant, resistant to the idea? I mean, if you felt after learning enough information from an accurate, uh, from an accurate opinion that would benefit positively for us, then would you actively advocate instead of deferring if you thought the entire benefit would be for the whole family? I've done every version. X, Y. I believe in, in trying everything. 
Absolutely. I believe in co-parenting therapy if it's possible. I believe in exes who are at conflict. I believe people that are not on the same play page. I believe in multi-generational. I believe in individual. I believe in long-term therapy. The, 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 the blog that I wrote on uh, the one there uh, toward the bottom, how to discover the real self, is that not that idea of, of long-term therapy? All right, folks, I'm going to go over some announcements, and then if there are any questions, I'll take them at the very end. We ask you to go to six 12-step support groups while your child is with us. Remember, these are free. See what kind of wisdom you can learn. Don't get caught up on the specifics of the other's story, but listen to the thinking that they're sharing with you. Please listen to and share our podcast. All the webinars get put on podcast the following day. Share them with the public. We had uh, about 50 people in New York, New York's parent meeting this, this last uh, Monday, and 10 or so of them came because they heard about us through the podcasts. So we're opening up our parent meetings to just about anybody. Uh, on your iPhone or iOS device, use the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. On an Android device, you can download the SoundCloud app or on a computer, go to the soundcloud.com website and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On Facebook, you find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. The Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook is for families who can't afford therapy, can't afford treatment. Of course, follow our blog. My book, some of this came from my book, of course, tonight is in there, is on Amazon.com. It's also available for Audible, on Audible or through a CD purchase. We just finished a workshop. The next one will be February 17th through 18th at Entrada. So that we invite all parents, if you can come, to go to that. Not every parent can do it. And if it does, check it out with your, your, your child's therapist to see if it coincides clinically, timing-wise, with a visit to the field. Contact gail at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. The next Finding You will be March 14th through 18th. So if you want to do deeper work, right? For me, this is as effective as, as any family intervention. If you want to do deeper work, sign up for Finding You. It's something I do, something everybody in my family has done, something we encourage all of our employees and managers and therapists to do. Um, and then Finding Family is for uh, custom for, for families, and I run those. You can email intensives at evoketherapy.com, go to our website, or call our admission staff for more questions. The next parent support group will be in Los Angeles. Uh, February 11th, 4 to 5 p.m. potluck. It's a Sunday, of course, so there's less traffic. That's why we do it on Sunday in Los Angeles. And then 5 to 7, there'll be the meeting. I'm not going to be in New York until March 21st, but we already have that date. Uh, March 21st, 7 to 9 at CUNY. We have these, we're mixing through all of these, so these are the ones we're going to get in the next few months. Seattle, Portland, Connecticut, New Jersey, Toronto, and the Bay Area. So probably in the next week or so, I'll have all of those dates announced here. Email andrea at evoketherapy.com to RSVP to any of these or for more information. We run a pursuits trip program that's is fun, adventure, activities for families or for young adults. Think sober fun or therapy light. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll answer any questions that have come in. So would you advocate actively to at least give a group therapist a try? I love group therapy. I think it's one of the most underutilized forms of therapy. So yes, I, I go every year, I go to, to a program with the same group of 13 guys for the last six years, right? That's something I do. It's a three or four day intensive uh, that I do with these guys. I, I run these now for professionals also at Evoke as a part of our, our new in, intensive and retreat house program in Park City, Utah. Um, so the Finding You is a group experience. It's a four-day retreat, intensive, but it's, it's group work, group together. So I'm a fan of group for sure. And then for, you, for adolescents, young adults, it's absolutely one of the more underutilized treatments, approaches out there. So you have already been, uh, you may already be doing this, but I feel that your intensives would be really incredible for families that have no child struggling, similar to the seven habits of highly effective families, so empowering. You're preaching to the choir here. Um, I could not, for me, it's the most important investment I've made in my own personal life. It's the most important investment 
I've made in the lives of my adult children and in my marriage. So I could not be more of a believer and I could not more passionately suggest. I think it can make as big of a difference as anything that we do. So finding you, finding families, absolutely, if you can. Who are the parent support programs for, uh, such as the one in March in New York City? Any, any, any parent, any parent that needs help, any parent that wants support. So, primarily evoke current and alumni families, but out of the 50 people, like I said, 10 or so didn't have a child at evoke ever, but just wanted to come for support. All right, folks, thanks for joining me tonight. I hope this was applicable. Hope it was beneficial. Hope it gave you something to take home, if not in terms of finding a therapist, but some of the concepts applied to, to parenting. This is a blog that I wrote and, and published two days ago, but I'm going to do a, a broadcast on it this Monday, this coming Monday, why your child should be your friend. Kind of in contrast to the old adage that you should be the parent, not the friend. I'm going to talk about some of the problems with that old adage. Some of the assumptions that I think need to be challenged in, in that idea. So that'll be Monday, January 29th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Hope you have a great weekend, safe weekend. Take care, and I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.